though because there's so many different ways you can you can play uh, you know on writing this book yeah what was really important for me was to tell the stories of those whose stories have never been told before so lots of books have been written about D-Day and about the, this momentous day in Second World War but they've all been told from the general's point of view or the officer's point of view but very very rarely do we hear the stories of the terrified 17 year olds 18 year olds these teenagers who were sent ashore you know at dawn on the 6th of June 1944 and it was their stories I wanted to tell because they were in the front line of battle and it was a they or it was dependent on them you know whether d-day would be a success or not right and so in doing that all right we've got some questions yeah. Yes. Mr. Milton, Mil this is Mike Uli. Good to meet you. Uh, I want to tell you I really enjoyed your book. I read part of the book, and I actually bought the audio version of the book, and I really enjoyed that, uh, the audio uh, version of that, and what you added to the text uh, with your uh, reading of the book. So thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, number one, let's just for some of our uh, listeners who are maybe a little bit younger, can you kind of give us some background about what D-Day is? So, so many of us, you know, assume what that, at least in my age group, we all know what that is, but can you explain that just a little bit for us? I will indeed, yes. So D-Day was the key turning point in World War II. It was the day on which the Americans, the Brits, and the Canadians, along with others, were going to reinvade Nazi-occupied Europe. So we were taking the battle to Hitler. Now this involved a massive operation that had never been seen before in the, in the history of warfare. On D-Day itself, 156,000 men were going to be landed in Normandy, in northern France, um, along with huge amounts of, of tanks, of equipment, of military hardware. And their task on that day was to carve out a beachhead, basically a safe area, onto which the uh, Allies could then land even more men and even more equipment. So really it was to be the turning point of the Second World War, because if the Allies succeeded in landing in France and, and succeeded in creating this beachhead, it means they could, they could ship from England just millions of tons of, of equipment that had been brought from America and elsewhere. So it was absolutely vital that uh, they won the, the battle on that day. And we hear these words, uh, Sword, uh, Juno, Gold, Omaha, and Utah, and those signify the beaches of the D-Day landing, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So the Allies had they found five beaches that they thought would be suitable for both infantry and for um, tanks and other, other machinery to come ashore. And they were given code names. Um, so there were two beaches were principally American. They were Utah and Omaha. There were two beaches that were principally British. They were Sword and Gold. And there was one beach that was principally uh, Canadian, and that was Juno. And the idea was the troops would land on these, these selected beaches and then fight their way inland in, in, in order to link up all the five beaches into one big beachhead. Yeah, and I want to talk about, and forgive me for focusing on Omaha as an American beach, but that was the one, I've been there, and that was one of the most impressive beaches for me. But so many of us, we think of beaches here, particularly in the eastern United States, and we think of Florida. Can you describe the terrain that these young participants, and I want to emphasize to folks that and how young these how young these soldiers were we've just gone through at least in this area of the country graduations and we see 17 and 18 year olds and i hope that folks imagine that those were the soldiers sailors airmen and marines who were carrying out this mission on d-day um, yeah, so. and it's, it's really shocking sometimes when you see the photos of these young soldiers. You know, I've got kids myself, and you just think uh, they just look, well, as they are, they look like teenage, teenage lads, and they were being sent into a ferocious battle. And you mentioned Omaha, the Amer one of the American beaches. Omaha was the worst of all of the five beaches. It was very heavily defended. The beach was very exposed. So just imagine you're a 17-year-old lad. You've got to run up a, a, a huge expanse of sand, you're being fired at by machine guns, you've got shells landing all around you, it's hell on earth. And once you, if 
you get to the top of the beach, Omaha was un un unlike the other beaches in that there were then cliffs behind the beach. They then had to scale these cliffs, knocking out German gun emplacements as they as they climbed. I mean, it was a it was a hell of a task to expect of of many of these young young lads had never been uh, in battle before, and you know many of them were simply terrified when they landed into this gunfire. Yeah, and I think it's. Uh uh, important you mentioned the elevation change it's not a, like a beach in Florida where it's flat and the elevation change may be 15 feet if I'm if I'm correct I think the elevation there was 150 to 200 feet these beaches um, it, it was a, it was a really really tough climb I mean if you, you could find photos on Google of Omaha Beach and it's it's almost vertical behind the beach and they were having to scale this and let's not forget when they landed they were already incredibly seasick because the sea was very 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 rough that day they hadn't slept they were exhausted they'd been sick all night and and in that condition they then had to uh, cross this beach under heavy gunfire and then uh, scale the cliffs knocking out these german bunkers on the way i mean uh, it's it's just remarkable when you think uh, what they were being asked to do and what they achieved and of course i think about point de hoc and what happened there with the rangers um, if you want to take a minute or two and talk about that, it just that was incre it's incredible to me to stand on Point Dock and think about what the Rangers did that morning. Yeah, the Rangers, of course, were, uh, they really were the elite of the elite. They were very well trained. Um, they knew exactly what they had to do. And what they had to do was this. There's a cliff, a very, very high cliff on that coastline of northern France called Pont du Hoc. And on top of that cliff were some very, very powerful German guns. It was essential for the Allies to knock out those guns because they had a range of miles. They could, they could fire on anything. So the Rangers' task was to climb up the cliff, these crumbling cliffs, uh, climbing up ropes, ropes under heavy gunfire, then uh, get, get onto the top of the cliff, kill all the Germans who were there, and then destroy the guns. Um, it was an uh, extraordinary operation, and one thing that went badly wrong was the fact that when they got to the top, they couldn't find the guns. In fact, the Germans had moved the guns and they'd hidden them. But the Rangers were incredibly, as I say, they were very well trained, they were very resourceful. They pushed in land, they found the guns where they'd been hidden, and they blew them sky high. So they succeeded um, in, their, in their operation, but then they found themselves stuck on this cliff top, being attacked from inland by the Germans, and they had to hang on, really, um, this, this sort of isolated band of men for the next 24 hours. It, they really went through hell, and uh, a lot of them lost their lives on, on that cliff top. Yeah, and one of the things, too, I mean, your book covers the 24 hours of D-Day, and if you could, the first wave, I mean, I describe it as a massacre. This is where the amphibious landing started. The landing craft had platoons of uh, infantry soldiers, uh, uh, you know, that uh, were going to have to go ashore. They let the doors down, and there were some of these craft where none of the soldiers survived. It was just an absolute massacre, at least the first wave. That's right. The first wave was the worst of all. Um, you're landing, yes, yeah, so you're in this landing craft, you're crouched down inside it, um, trying to avoid any gunfire that's being fired out to sea from the German defenders. Um, then, as you say, the, the landing craft comes into the beach, the, the ramp at the front goes down, and what you're supposed to do is run up the beach and try and knock out any German machine guns or bunkers. Um, as you can imagine, you are a sitting duck when you come out of that, when the ramp goes down, and all the German machine guns suddenly are firing at you. So it was a terrifying experience. Uh, we've talked about Omaha, which we turned rapidly into a complete massacre. However, on some beaches, um, the Allied troops got off more lightly. So on Utah Beach, which was another American beach, in fact, um, the fact that they landed in slightly the wrong place meant that they came onto a piece of beach that didn't have too many German defenders. And in fact, the casualty rate on Utah Beach was remarkably light. But um, for every beach where it was light, there was another beach where it was very, very heavy. Yeah, and you, you described that first wave, and eventually things change. The tide does begin to turn slowly. I recount, I recall the story with General Cotta, who I was familiar with the story a little bit anyway. But in your mind, what finally changed the tide? Uh, it, on Omaha Beach after the initial after the initial wave. 
Well, I think there are a few things. So if you imagine that there's all these bunkers, these German bunkers along the beach, these strongholds, it only takes one of those to be knocked out, and you've suddenly um, cleared a few hundred yards of beach into which men can land without being fired on. So one by one, very, very brave American soldiers knocked out some of these strongholds, and that enabled men to come ashore um, uh, uh, not under fire. Then you have leadership. You mentioned Cotter, um, an amazing, inspirational leader who came onto the beach. He saw that the massacre was taking place, and really he just rallied his men, and he just said, you know, if you stay on the beach, you're dead. So just get up and get in land. You've got to push off the beach. And remarkably, his words just, just did inspire these terrified men, and they, they started to do exactly what he ordered. Um, and And... So that was another really important factor. And lastly, I think, was that by about 10 in the morning, the American, the big guns, the big naval guns, because you've got to remember there were huge battleships anchored offshore, they began to fire at the German defences um, on the shore. They'd been worried about firing before because they were worried about you know, hitting their own men. But it was so desperate that they started this amazing artillery bombardment, which really began to pound away at the German defences on the beach. Yeah, it's interesting. I think Kata's, the story about Kata was, and, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, you can correct me, but he said something to his men to the effect that uh, we're dying on the beaches, let's get inland and die at least. So, anyway. That's, yeah, one of, that's one of his sort of fabled quotes. Yeah. Uh, another one, of course, is he spotted some rangers on the beach, and he said these are this, this rallying cry. He said, rangers, your rangers, he said, lead the way. And uh, with that, the rangers began to climb up the cliffs. Norm Cotter, he was an extraordinary individual. He seemed completely immune to, to gunfire, to being hit. He'd, he'd, um, he'd be walking around, swirling his revolver on his finger, smoking his trademark cigar, um, and, uh, you know, all around him, men were getting killed, and yet he seemed remarkably un untouchable by, uh, from the German point of view. Well, we, t we talked about the landing, and I'm sorry to go so quickly, because, uh, I mean, we could spend hours on this. Um, the airborne operations, uh, very interesting to me, that occurred before the landings, uh, and I am just absolutely, when I saw the gliders that were involved, uh, the airborne operations of parachute, I understand that, I've actually done that before, um, but the guys that were on gliders, uh, absolutely amazing. Can you talk about that? I mean, they had to, they actually crashed these things, and then they had to get up uh, and fight. Yeah, this was um, at the eastern end of the entire landing zone. Um, this is where the British troops were sent in. So they were sent in in these gliders at night. So it was just after midnight, six hours before the landings on the beaches. There was these um, extraordinary daring raids on deep into um, deep into enemy-occupied Normandy, northern France. And so one one group of 168 lads were sent in. British lads were sent in on these gliders, which crash landed into into the. The, the farmland of Normandy, they then had to, their task was to capture two absolutely critical bridges, because if they didn't cap, they capture these bridges, the American, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the German panzer divisions, the, the armored divisions, could sweep across these bridges and push the Allied forces back into, into the sea, you know, very soon after they'd landed. But if these men managed to hold these bridges, they could stop any German counterattack. So that was a vital operation at the eastern end, that was run by the Brits, and then of course at the western end, you have the paratroop drops, the airborne divisions, the Americans coming in and um, seizing vital road bridges, railway junctions, and of course the town of St. Mary Glees, a really important town just inland from Utah Beach. This was a key target, and that was taken by the American airborne troops. And that was a key target because it, it uh, uh, held the key to transportation to a highway, is that right? That's right. I mean, it was, it was important because uh, a number of roads ran through St. Mary Glees, but also its proximity to Utah Beach. If the Germans had retained control of St. Mary Glees, they would have been able to really attack head-on uh, the American troops landing on Utah. So it was vital for the Airborne Division to take this town. Um, it should be said that the airborne landings went uh, very badly wrong in the sense that it was incredibly difficult to drop men at night in pitch darkness. They landed, if they landed um, without broken legs, they were lucky. Uh, if they, they landed, they didn't know where they were, they were completely lost, and they had to then fight. And so it was incredibly to 
tall order for these men, uh, dis disorientated, uh, lost, um, and, and we lost all their comrades as well. They formed themselves into impromptu little bands of men and went on the, went on the attack. Yeah, I was amazed, I didn't know this, that uh, your book indicated that there were the airplanes that dropped the airborne, only one in ten actually had a navigator. Amazing. Yeah, this is um, extraordinary because you have to imagine there are thousands of these planes flying at night uh, with no radar equipment, with no lights on, with no very little navigation. Um, it was a terrifying experience for the pilots of these planes and for everyone in them because if anything went wrong, they knew they were they were seconds away from disaster. Now. When they flew across the channel from England to France, the skies were clear and it was relatively easy to fly in formation. But as soon as they hit the French coast, there was a huge um, cloud of fog on the coast. And of course, they all flew into this and they couldn't see anything. And it was a miracle, really, that more of them didn't crash. Um, and it was a miracle that so many of the men managed to jump out and make it to the ground, uh, you know, alive and just about okay. Yeah, amazing. I, I thought it was also amazing that when you talked about the twilight of D-Day, D-Day began to a great extent with the airborne operations. It also, to a great extent, ended around twilight with the resupply, with the gliders bringing in supplies, men, additional troops, equipment. So uh, yeah. it sort of began yeah, so and ended. I think this was this was really um, really important for morale for the men at the end of D Day. They were exhausted. They hadn't slept for several days. You know, they'd been ill on the crossing. They'd been fighting all day. They'd been through hell. And then, as um, dusk arrived on D Day, they looked at the sky and they saw thousands and thousands of gliders coming into land. And this was reinforcements. It was new supplies. It was new men coming. And you know, I read so many accounts of the men saying that it just raised their spirits at the end of a terrible, terrible day. You know, Denise, do you um, have a question? I, I do have one question, and that's just uh, when you compiled your information about the book and personal interviews with survivors, um, could you give us a little insight of what that was like and the emotions uh, during these interviews? Yes, in fact, lots of the um, lots of the material I used, in fact, rather than interviewing very elderly people, because of course all the veterans now are well into their nineties, and it's often difficult to interview um, very very elderly people. Uh, you know, memories become confused, and so a lot of the interviews I, I used were when they'd been interviewed um, many many years ago, when their memories were still fresh, when they could remember uh, absolutely everything that happened to them. Because I wanted to compile a very very detailed account of what they went through. Having said that, I was in Normandy last week, I was filming something for the BBC, and we took um, a 93-year-old veteran, a British veteran, back to Gold Beach, where he landed at 6.30 in the morning on the 6th of June, and it was remarkable, you know, he said that um, for him, every single day of his life, he'd relived D-Day, and he'd relived the fact that many of his friends had been killed on the beach, including his best friend who died in his arms. So for these men, um, who then had to fight on through France and fight on into Germany, I mean, this, this was a very, very powerful um, you know, memory that can, could never be erased. And talking to him when he talked about what happened on the, on the 6th of June, 75 years ago, he remembered it crystal clearly. Yeah, one of the things that uh, was very uh, interesting to me about the book, it was sort of a realization. I, I recall your description of Eisenhower, you know, at midnight, one o'clock, before he got some rest, he was there with his uh, Case Othersby, uh, his driver and his assistant, I don't remember the name, his aide. Um, he was chain smoking the Chesterfields, and I always think of Eisenhower as this stoic individual that was always in control, but I think your book, and if you want to comment, I think it does an awesome job of explaining the burden and the anxiety that he had. And at the same time, it, it occurred to me that that same anxiety that the gen, you know the Supreme Allied Commander was going through, to a great extent, was the same anxiety that uh, existed as the uh, participants at the lower levels boarded those landing craft or got into their airplanes to do a jump over France. Can you talk about that and how the anxiety was maybe to a great extent? Um, yeah, I think very similar. to Eisenhower, he felt the real, the weight of responsibility that he was potentially sending tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Allied servicemen to their deaths. 
and you know he went and he would try and meet uh, troops uh, before they set sail or but he met some of the airborne troops and he was in tears after I mean he didn't show it to the men but when he got back into his car he was in tears because it was just an incredible responsibility but um, not only was he sending uh, you know up to two million men into battle over the over the weeks that followed he was also dealing with incredibly difficult uh, generals like Mon British the British general Montgomery who was in command of all the land forces all these generals had very big egos um, they all thought they knew what was best and so Eisenhower not only did he have to be the general soldier um, but he also had to be a diplomat treading a very fine line between all these uh, these egos so um, yes the accounts of him on that night when D-Day is finally launched um, uh, it was a very risky time to launch it, of course, it should be said, because the weather was terrible. No one knew if these ships would, at the landing craft would actually get across the channel without sinking. Um, he was very nervous, and as, as you said, he chain-smoked throughout the night. Um, he couldn't sleep at all. Uh, but the accounts of uh, his aide, which was Harry Butcher, said you know, he just looked absolutely terrible um, because, yeah, he was bearing this weight of responsibility. And something your listeners may or may not know, of course, he wrote two press releases that night, one of which, which was to be released the following day, said that the landings have been successful, you know, the Allies have landed in Normandy, but he wrote a second one, which happily he never had to use, which said, our landings have failed and I, uh, General Eisenhower, take full responsibility for the disaster that's ensued. Happily, that second one he never had to release. Amen. It's interesting, you talk, I don't want to talk about the generals too much, but you, you talk about the generals on the Allied side, but it was also interesting what was going on in terms of, uh, I don't know if power struggle is the right word, but uh, Rommel had some ideas about how they ought to prepare for D-Day. I think General Rommel, who was a German general, uh, actually expected the invasion to come where, that it, where it did, but uh, he also wanted Hitler to... Um, commit some panzer divisions that ultimately weren't committed until I think afternoon on June the 6th. So uh, would things have turned out differently if, if Hitler had listened to Rommel? Yes, Rommel, of course, was a brilliant general. The British knew him very well because General Montgomery, the British general, had been fighting against him and been victorious against him in North Africa. So he knew Rommel. Rommel was brilliant. Rommel did indeed expect the Allies to land in Normandy because he'd looked at all the beaches of northern France and he said, they will land here. This is exactly the sort of beach they landed on in Sicily. This is the sort of beach they landed on in Italy. I know they're going to land here. Now... Rommel's strategy was, uh, was a simple one and would have been effective, I think, um, had he been allowed to do it, which was he said, you've got to hit the Allies hard and fast as soon as they land. So as they're coming onto the beaches, seasick, tired uh, and exhausted, um, you have to hit them with the, the mechanized panzer divisions, the really uh, elite of the elite German troops. But Hitler refused to release the panzer divisions uh, to, to, to into Rommel's uh, hands, and this meant that the Allies had a good 10, 12 hours to get themselves ashore before they faced um, some of these crack panzer division units. And it was a fatal mistake on Hitler's part, and Rommel knew it. He was furious that Hitler would not allow these panzer divisions to be used. And I think D-Day could have been very different. The outcome could have been very different. I, I still think the Allies almost certainly would have got ashore. They had control of the skies, for one thing. But the Germans could have made it much, much more difficult um, had those panzer divisions been released earlier in the day. Yeah, and of course Hitler thought, I guess, uh, purportedly, that the, that the, uh, D -Day, the initial D-Day invasion, I think, was a, a diversion and the main invasion was going to come at Calais, which was a shorter distance from the British coast. Yes, it's worth mentioning that because this was one of the, the most brilliant deception operations of the Second World War. The Allies um, they op launched this thing called Operation Fortitude, and the whole idea of Operation Fortitude was to pretend that the Allies were going to land, as you say, in the Calais area, which meant that uh, huge numbers of troops, um, Hitler kept them up in the area to meet this uh, you know anticipated invasion of course it was complete it was a complete fake 
that never what this army um, did never existed. But the Allies went so far as to produce dummy tanks. They made tanks out of canvas and had them all lined up in fields in in in, in the south of England. So Hitler really believed it, which which was fantastic for the Allies because it meant that they faced fewer German forces than they might otherwise have faced when they landed in Normandy. Yeah, and speaking of that, you mentioned that we controlled the air. What 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 happened with the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force? Yes, there's one remarkable statistic, which I'll give you in one second. The Luftwaffe, of course, Germany was being heavily bombed um, by uh, both the uh, you Americans and us Brits um, from the air, and so many of the Luftwaffe had been moved closer to Germany to try and defend the uh, towns and cities of Germany, and this meant that the uh, Normandy was dreadfully exposed. There were hardly any planes brought into action, and in fact, the statistic is something like on on D-Day itself, the Germans flew 170 odd sorties that day, only 170 odd sorties of planes, whereas the Allies flew 14 and a half thousand. That gives you just some idea of the complete mismatch in the numbers between, you know, the German Luftwaffe and the Allied Air Forces. Yeah, that was amazing to me. And by the way, that mentioned the, the weather is also another interesting story um, in terms of uh, the weather prediction. You want if you can talk about that just a little bit. It seems to me just yeah, absolutely amazing. The weather's very interesting because the weather. It was one of the worst Junes um, ever for, in terms of weather in the English Channel. Uh, you know our summers are not great over here, but that was a really really bad one. It was very stormy, and there were very limited opportunities to launch the invasion because the tides had to be right, the moon had to be right, and so Eisenhower had to decide. He first wanted to launch the invasion on the fifth of June, but it was cancelled at the very last minute because the, the wind and the seas were so rough that it almost certainly would have failed. Um, the 6th of June was slightly better, not much better, but slightly better, and he took the very bold decision, and it was his decision alone, and this gives some idea of the responsibility of, of a supreme commander. He took the decision to launch the invasion on the 6th of June. One key factor was that the skies were going to be sufficiently clear to enable the Allied air forces to bomb German positions on the ground. So, um, but, but yes, it was really touch and go until the last minute as to whether they would be able to launch the invasion on that day. And, and of course it's interesting, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the Germans made a conclusion that the weather was not conducive to an invasion. And for instance, Rommel, of course it was his wife's birthday, he actually drove back to Germany, the, I don't know, it was a 10, 12 hour drive, for his wife's, his yes, wife's the, birthday. the Germans here made a catastrophic mistake. They thought that the weather was so bad that the Allies would simply not launch an invasion in that weather. They stood down all the naval, uh, the naval patrol boats that night. They stood down all their generals. Um, and uh, as you're, you're absolutely right in saying that Rommel himself, who's in command of this great German army in northern France, goes home to be with his wife. And so there's, apt, there's no one there, there's no one senior there at the point at which uh, they realize that this is the Allied invasion. It was, um, you know, as I, I've mentioned, the, so many men were seasick, they were so ill uh, traveling in these very, very heavy seas. And yet, it gave the Allies one key advantage, and that was the element of surprise, which was to be so important in the, in the early hours of the launching the invasion. Yeah, it was interesting, and then Rommel had uh, purchased a pair of shoes for his wife. He had to leave, and then ultimately they didn't fit. That was fortuitous, I think. Yes, <laughs> that was a nice little detail I found, that yes, he bought them in Paris, these very chic, uh, very lovely Parisian French shoes, and um, gave them to her, and yes, alas, they did not, uh, they didn't fit. Of course, um, when Rommel realized the invasion was taking place, he rushed back to uh, Normandy from Germany, uh, from Germany where he was, but it was a 12-hour drive, so by the time he got to back to Normandy, you know, the Allies were ashore in considerable numbers and and really i think he knew that evening that actually the war was lost because he'd always said if the allies get ashore if they establish a beachhead we've lost the war and so i think he knew that very night that it was all over yeah and of course we know rommel um was given a choice to be tried or commit suicide i think it was in july of that year and committed suicide that that summer that's right, his ending was a, a pretty miserable one. Uh, he did indeed commit suicide. He sort of took the, took the, the weight of responsibility for the failure um, of the, uh, the counterattacks, of pushing the Allies back into the sea, where, of, of course, there is one man um, who really should carry all the responsibility for 
for the failure of the Germans on D-Day, and that is Hitler himself, who had, as I said, who had not allowed the elite uh, crack armoured divisions to come and fight the uh, Allies when they were still seasick and, t and, and scared on the beaches. Can you talk a little bit, this is towards the, after Twilight, there was a, you recounted a walk that Ernie Powell, who is an incredibly famous journalist, um, his walk on the beach at Omaha, and um, just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I found this a very sort of poignant end to the day um, when, uh, yes, you're right, Ernie Powell's walking along Omaha Beach and sees just the wreckage of war. You know, as we said, Omaha had, uh, Omaha had taken the brunt of the German counterattack. Um, hundreds of American servicemen had lost their lives on the beach. All, you know, dozens of tanks, of armored bulldozers, of jeeps, they were all lying crippled on the beach, burnt out shells. It was hell on earth, and he just walks along the beach and leaves. He writes this incredibly poignant description of just the sort of horrors of what it was like to serve, you know, in the front line of, of the assault on, on Nazi-occupied Europe. It was it's just amazing. And your book brings this to life. So many times I've read history books that are about D-Day, but your book does such an excellent job of bringing out these individual stories of what these soldiers, uh, sailors, airmen, and marines, and others had to go through. Um, you know, we talk about courage is not the absence of fear, uh, but it's being able to act uh, when anxiety and fear exists. And it, it, I can't even imagine what they went through, um, whether it was the airborne troops, the glider troops, the folks doing the amphibious landing. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, you told so many stories that brought that to life, not just the not just the statistics and the typical sterile uh, history that we get from so many books. So um, that Ernie Powell story was very poignant for me as well. Yeah, I, I suppose really what I wanted to do is that so much has been written about D-Day and so much has been written by the officers and the generals and we, we just don't hear, so often we don't hear the voices of these, these young conscripts who, who didn't want to be there. They were terrified and yet they were thrown into, um, you know, into the firing line basically um, and I wanted to, just to give their raw, unvarnished accounts of what it was like to be there on that historic day which, you know, we'll be celebrating next week the, the 75th anniversary of that historic day yep and they're very solemn stories but there are also other stories that uh, are very interesting your story about george lane and rommel incredibly interesting their interaction i'll leave that to folks to to read the book or listen to the book uh to find out what that's about but that was an interesting story as well yeah, there, was, there were many, many stories, and there are many, of course, there are many tragic stories, but there are many stories of, of, of real, true heroism and comradeship, um, men working together as teams and pulling through uh, uh, because of teamwork. Uh, so, although, you know, in some ways uh, there, are, there are depressing stories, but there are also uplifting ones as well, that men who went beyond themselves, beyond the call of duty, to, to do what they had to do. And, that, you know, it's, it's really extraordinary that so many, uh, in their 90s will be going back next week probably for a final time to be where they were you know 75 years ago and um, Giles we want to ask for our listeners that are sitting on the edge of their chairs wanting to know how can they get your book they can get my book on, on Amazon, they can get my book on, uh, on Barnes & Noble, any good bookstore, bookstore I hope in America will have it. It's called, it's got a very long uh, title, it's called, so, well I'll give you the first bit, Soldier, Sailor, Frogman, Spy, and uh, with a subtitle of How the Allies Won on D-Day. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you, um, you know, shedding light on it this morning. You were fantastic. We've kept you a little bit longer, and I, I, I think we could. I'm with Mike. I think we could have stayed all day long. I just, I love that it's the history, and it, it's nice to to uh, to hear it from a different angle. And I felt like I learned a lot this morning. Well, that's great. Well, I'm really uh, very, very pleased that you had me on. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you, Giles. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Wow. <laughs> of course, Ernie Pyle, we like to claim him as our own and with Indiana University and Pyle Hall and um, such a, a wonderful journalist. Well, the story in the book was uh, um, about Ernie Pyle, not his uh -huh. writing, but he walked the, that evening after on D-Day, he walked the beaches and he described, you know, the carnage in terms of equipment, things like that. But the things that he noticed were the personal effects, the pictures, the little trinkets. 
from real people, real soldiers who had sacrificed there that day. Do so. you feel like it's hard sometimes, and, and I'm sure that this is, you know, a degree of difficulty of anybody, you know, going to do interviews, but to get the soldiers to talk, sometimes they just try, try to repress, you know, I mean, some of that's just a little too much, you know, to just bring back, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of his interview was secondhand accounts. He didn't actually interview a lot of the folks firsthand, mm -hmm. but I can imagine that it was very difficult to get them to talk about a lot of what went on, particularly the very um, graphic portions of yeah. what occurred that day. And you, and I, I love that. I mean, you think about. I mean, like they weren't like they had been rested all that day long, got up early morning, and had a nice breakfast. And you know, I mean, you know, it wasn't that kind of a situation. Well, they. I mean, they I think. They had undergone so much anxiety and anticipation of when this was going to occur because the th literally the stars had to align, the moon, the, the weather, and they were under so much anxiety. And most people know, at least in our, you know, today, anxiety wears you out in and of itself. They had to get on the ships. They had to wait. If you've ever been across the English Channel, it's not the calm Gulf of Mexico, even in its best. Um, so to, to cross that. You know the, the the English Channel. I mean, they were wore out when they got there. And yeah. seasick. And seasick. Yeah. The folks on the gliders. I can't emphasize enough. These gliders crashed. They're made out of canvas and wood. These these guys crashed. They were unconscious. They had broken arms. They had broken legs. And they had to get up and go do their mission, whatever it was. So, so it's like just a incredible. glider, like let's think of like one today. Like when you hear the word glider, you have like a little bit of a motor and nothing like that. No, this is like a little small airplane where the fo they were enclosed and I. Apologize, I don't know how many went into each glider, but there were a number of uh, many soldiers that oh, okay. went into each glider, oh, okay. and they were towed with larger airplanes, and they were let loose, and they had objectives, usually bridges in the rear area, because what was supposed to happen on D-Day, there were airborne troops to the rear, and then the amphibious landing at the beach, and they were supposed to, and they did, to a great extent anyway, they were to come together as the day progressed. So. Oh absolutely amazing wow lots of information and um, celebrating next week yeah June the 6th mm -hmm. and uh, it'll be the 75th anniversary so very good get the book now uh, from Giles Milton all right wonderful yeah, right. I, I will say again yeah. too that the I really enjoyed the audio I, I kind of did a little bit of both I read mm -hmm. portions of the book and listened to the audio the audio is worth listening to if you're one of those folks who do a lot of driving in particular or just don't okay. have time to carry a book. Absolutely, very nice. And you, you can look forward it. I know a lot of us do Amazon shopping. Yes. Uh, and it is on Amazon. All right, I'm kind of switching gears, but today is, and uh, I guess yesterday, you know, uh, with a lot of uh, Memorial Day, and uh, we know uh, we want to say hats off to our our uh, veterans and thank you for your service and had a wonderful program up it at was Crown Hill wonderful Cemetery. Brett, Brett Walters did, did an excellent job. job yes that was I really enjoyed we enjoyed listening to him absolutely and so then uh, also with that we had a lot of cooking out people did a lot of grilling out so, but today is actually National Hamburger Day and it's kind of interesting our five favorite toppings can you guess what's your favorite topping Mike. Mine or the serve? Mine's no, onion. Mine's onion. onion. Okay. What, what would yours I would have to say onion and pickles. Okay. All right. Well, number one uh, topping is cheese. Seventy-nine percent of Americans like. Uh, I got that one without saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is interesting. Uh, the rest of the five are lettuce. Seventy-one percent said tomato. Now I figured tomato would be up higher. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Especially if it's a fresh garden tomato, mm -hmm. right? Um, let's see, onions, oh, coming in low, 58%. Wow. Pickles lower, 54%. And um, their favorite uh, type of cheese to use on a burger is American. Okay. Okay. Uh, and 66% like American, 65% like cheddar, 43% Swiss, and 40% uh, pepper jack. And um, then their favorite burger chains are... The Golden Arches, of course. <laughs> is that number one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, my family would say, yeah. yeah. Uh, number two was Five Guys. Oh, I love Five Guys. Yeah. Number three, Wendy's. Number four, Burger King. And number five, coming in, Steak and Shake. Okay. We All have right. a couple of those. Yeah. All right. And according to the survey, the five cities that love burgers are, I'd have to say, <laughs> I don't know why we're not on here. Okay. Seattle. Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, and Miami. Okay. Yeah. All right. I wouldn't know. 
guess those. But yeah, I know. What about us? <laughs> we didn't make it, okay? All right, we have to hit it harder, okay? But anyway, I just thought that was that was kind of interesting. And some, uh, let's see here real quick. Let's see what today is. Let's get our today is. Everybody loves it. Everybody, if we miss it, they're like, you didn't do today is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, today is, uh, of course, we just said the hamburger day. Um, today is National Brisket Day. Ooh, love a good brisket. Yep. This is mm -hmm. a good day. Yeah. Hamburgers and brisket. <laughs> no question about it. We need to go eat. Um, let's see here. Slugs return. Okay, day. All the slugs. And don't I'm like them. Okay, you do not like them. No. Okay, I don't either. Do you? No. Who's no. advocating for? <laughs> slug I don't know. Day, by I the don't way. know. That's just a little bit. That's just. That's it. That's all there is today. I all hate right. to say what I do with a slug when I see it on Slug Day. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not much of a celebration. Not for very them. good. Not very good. And we do have. And uh, this is. This is. I do want to say that I can't put a hundred percent into this, but. We have uh, actually Terry Bennett uh, shared it on my Facebook uh, that there was a, and he has said that there was a mama and two baby bears found in Camelsburg. So okay. now, really? Yeah, and now according to the photo, it does look like something. Now someone said that it might be a tom turkey, but um, <laughs> they're trying to figure out whether it's true or not. So there might be bear in those woods. Well, <laughs> there's getting a, ready for the festival, you know, getting ready for the Well, if there's festival. a bear with uh, young ones, folks probably should be careful about that. Yeah. I think and it, it's kind of hard. I'm trying to picture the comparison between a tom turkey and I a bear. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Someone says, is that a tom turkey? <laughs> Denise has better vision than I do. I, I can I, do that I, without I, my contacts. Yeah, I was going to say, well, Terry's a smart man sure because his that. photo is not real close. And I don't think I would have gotten real close either. I think this would have been one of those, I have to use one of those lens. Like, we'll Telephoto. Yeah, because I don't think. And yeah. recently, one of our kids sent a picture in the area of Spring Mill. And I don't have my phone with me, but it was some kind of very large cat and not, oh. not domestic. So I, I thought that was interesting too. Of course, nowadays you don't know what's Photoshop, you know, it's... Yeah, um, absolutely. Right. I well, will tell you this, it's interesting. We were talking, I don't know, I've seen more snakes this year. Uh, and I've heard that everybody uh, that seems is, like... Everybody has been talking about that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the reason for that is, if that's just my experience, but it seems like other folks are saying the same thing. I have to agree, 100%. I've noticed that too. And usually like, you know, you're hearing, and I'm not saying that we don't have the ticks and, you know, and all that. But, but snakes are really, and everybody, and they seem like they're more aggressive too. They're coming out, they're more, you know I mean? Of course, you know, that's something I... <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not a snake fan. I haven't noticed necessarily being more aggressive, and fortunately I haven't seen any copperheads yet, but there have been mostly black snakes, but definitely more. Definitely. So just just be careful out there for sure. Yeah, something that you do not want to run into. <laughs> I keep it in mind every time I walk out in the yard. Because yeah being in the woods but don't they aren't don't they like i think like don't they like if you like i stomp hard because <laughs> don't they like if they feel like you're coming they're more afraid of you they say this is i don't know i'm not a snake expert at all i'm not either but i do it's interesting you say that the other day i was down close to the creek and there was a water snake actually it was fit quite a ways out of the water um and that's what it did just scared it and it scurried off so and i read several uh, alligator attacks lately, not in our area. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness for that. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. You know, Florida, and um, there was one at Hilton Head. At a, did you read that? A golf course, uh, gated area where a woman tried to save her dog, and it actually got her. And that was that was oh, a I fatality. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, I didn't hear that so, one. Yeah. Yeah, you don't uh, hear about it too much and usually killing people but they do go for the smaller dogs i think mm -hmm. it's a nice nice meal if you're a large alligator i guess yeah then also then there was a shark attack yes i read that, that? 65 yeah. year old man yeah um, yeah he was only what uh, he, he it, was it in california uh, i'm i kind of don't recall that exactly yeah, but yeah. yes uh, i guess it severed his leg and yeah and he wasn't in that deep of water. And right. you don't have to be, you know, when when I had, <laughs> do we want to talk about my shark? Go ahead. No one else wants to hear about it. You know, I wasn't in that deep of water either, you know what I mean? So, you know, they, they don't come right up to you. What you happened? Know? I don't know what, what happened. Oh, Mike, it, 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 it's been kind of a, because when I talk about it, everybody's like, oh, 
you know, because I do talk about it, and it's like in my family, just like yeah, eyes are rolling, and my family like, and so okay, Greg and, says I made a mistake. Brad Gilbert's <laughs> like, don't talk about sharks around Becky, because okay. she's gonna talk. No, okay, so I was so I had we had we just got into Florida, and it was on the um, I get I get confused, the side where the water's murky, it's not the clear side, the it's the. Is it Jacksonville? Yeah, Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, okay. where the it's kind of a move. It's more the I can't remember what side of the. Anyway, it's more the murky water. Right. And so, we were of course wanting to you know coming from Indiana. Of course, we're ready to get our tan on. So we were we were laying out, and um, and there was a gentleman and he was fishing, and I he was you know throwing out what do you call that? Um, what are the, what are they? Chum? chum, yeah, they was throwing out chum, and I said, I said I'm from Indiana, and I said, uh, I said I don't mean anything, you know, rude or anything, but is that not a conflict of interest while I'm swimming? You know, oh no, 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 you know, he's no, you're fine, whatever, you know. So anyway, so um, we were had laid out, and so we weren't thinking, and you know how you're just so hot and, and everything. So it was, we, you know, we we go into the water, and next thing I know, there's a lifeguard screaming, shark, shark. I look down, and there's two sharks right beside me right right by my legs and you know and I'm like oh my gosh remember so when Jesus walked on water the other the other person that walked on water was oh, it's me <laughs> okay. yeah the other person in history was yeah, me gotcha. I did, you know you're supposed to stay still but no I didn't do anything that you're supposed to do so anyway and so then they came running over you know and they were like are you okay are you okay and I'm like yeah but I'm like so I'm like do we call the news channels they said did you get bit no so they were like, no, we don't do anything. They said, it's just like, and so she didn't, obviously the lifeguard didn't know Indiana because she said, because she said, she made the reference. She said, it'd just be like you in Indiana, bears in your woods, you're going to have sharks in the water. You're in their water, you're in their territory. And if they wanted you, they would have had you. So then I, so then I had to make a joke. Of course, they didn't want corn fed Indiana. Uh, they didn't, you know, then I was insulted, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not good enough for a right. shark. Okay. I guess I don't All know, right. but they know. And then she said that it wasn't, it wasn't, they feed of a morning and of an evening and I was right there in that thank goodness I was in that happy mid middle there that they weren't feeding because they said if they would have been feeding they would have had you yeah. they would have bit you but anyways well, we're doing a lot everybody's changing their plans their Florida trip or the Florida vacation plans we're talking about sharks and alligators this morning so. yeah well, well and, and I, I yeah saw, I also read that there was um, shark there was a alligator attack where a woman was only in waist deep in a lake in Florida and you know whenever I see a body of water in Florida I think alligator because mm -hmm. it is it is so common yes yeah. so I don't know how you could be surprised I think two people got in and pulled her away from that but it did get her so that's that's pretty scary very scary well, I think if you're I'm around them some because we fish in Florida but mm -hmm. um, I think there you get used to them and you, there's a lot more encounters you're around them a lot more than folks from the Midwest realize so right it's you know it's just the numbers they don't they don't attack that many people and when it does it makes the news right. and of course you would think at Disney World you were that would be a safe oh, haven yeah. away yeah. from them of course a couple of years ago there was such a tragic event with a little child and mm -hmm. Grand Floridian at that yeah. beach and you just would never have thought that so now whenever we're going maybe from Magic Kingdom over to Wilderness Lodge. That's all I'm thinking about. Can I see um, an alligator? alligator. How yeah. fast? You know, do we have our tennis shoes on? How fast can we run? That's right. We just have to be faster than Frank. Okay. That's right. I don't think I can beat him on that one. But <laughs> well, you know, they um, they said that I heard someone from Florida, of course, uh, say that any body of water in Florida is probably going to have a have a well, sometime an alligator in it that's mm -hmm. what i don't know but but you know but here of course now we, we're just hearing about this morning about you know bears and stuff but usually here in indiana the only thing we have to deal with is deer you know that would be more what we would have and they're pretty calm i mean they're pretty <laughs> you know mm -hmm. i'm saying it's a big difference since and i think sometimes we don't realize because we are in a double landlocked state we don't realize that when you do get into florida and you get into the ocean I mean, you're in their territory, you know. So sometimes the deer can be dangerous when we're driving, though. There may well, be that's, a, that is zone. true about that. Well, that Absolutely. Is, that's we have had raccoons also in the trash already. So have you? You have? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Then I've right. seen skunk babies and bunnies, so Dude. yay for life, I guess, yeah. right? Spring has right. sprung. <laughs> We're fortunate to have our own wildlife, aren't we? That is true. I'll take I'll take a deer and a, of course, not on the road. I'm with Mike on that for sure. But I'll take a deer and a raccoon any day over yeah. a big shark. So. Me too. <laughs> or alligator. But. Absolutely. All right, Mike, thanks for coming in. And uh, we appreciate, we. Um, Mike is, uh, you know, quite a... Uh, a story and you and you really did your homework on that and I I could have listened to you guys all day long I just didn't know how long we could have Giles because yeah. you know that was a um, but uh, but I really appreciate you coming in you those questions and it's such a good it's I felt like we had a history lesson Denise yes you and I, I do and, and this would be a, a wonderful Father's Day present absolutely this book, so absolutely yeah. Yeah. After yeah, my dad's asked to read it. As a matter of fact, I couldn't yeah. give it to him until I finished. But mm -hmm. yeah. anyway, he's well, asked to read the thing, I'm so it's really, it's really good book. Yeah. All right, let's thank our sponsors. Yeah, we need to thank our sponsors this morning: um, Fox Perley Wealth Management, also Kentucky Annick Cat and Core, Meadowview Healthcare, Dr. Mindy Gunn, Ace Hardware of Salem, Who's Your Uplands, Salem Crossing, Salem Lumber, Weapons Pro. Centra Credit Union and Walmart. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here with this informative and wonderful program. All right. And happy Tuesday, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. Take, Take care. surgery, injury, or illness. Meadowview and Salem Crossing are the best choices for helping you recover. Our Moving Forward Rehabilitation Program offers a full range of therapies. We're here to help you return home safely with the skills you need to live life on your own terms. Meadowview and Salem Crossing, two great options for your rehabilitation. To learn more, visit ASCCare.com or call 888-996-8272. Caring people make the difference. You can feel it the minute you walk into Meadowview Health and Rehabilitation. Experts in long-term care, not just doing a job, but following a calling. They're here to help you and your family find answers, solutions, and peace of mind. In fact, they become an extension of your family. For more information about Meadowview, visit ASCSeniorCare.com or call 812-883-4681. That's 812-883-4681. Spring cleaning is upon us. Let Kentucky and a Cat and Core Recycling help you out. We take most recyclable metals, copper, brass, aluminum, steel, electric motors, and of course, catalytic converters. Now accepting brass shell casings and tungsten carbide drill bits, we are now taking automotive and lawnmower batteries. We will do free removal of appliances within a 15-mile radius of Salem. We have competitive prices and a hometown atmosphere. Call me, Jeremy Heath, at 812-946-0774. Come see us at Kentucky and a Cat and Core Recycling for your recycling needs. At this time, we are still not accepting aluminum cans. At KCC, we try to give the most competitive prices to all of our customers, no matter if they are a business or an individual. We strive to treat everyone with the same respect that they deserve. Our customers make KCC a great place of business because we cannot be great without them. Thank you for all choosing KCC. God bless.